Uh, I have to apologize here from the beginning, for this will be too long. Uh, in other words, too short. For the more you say, the more is left to be said. What am I doing here? Here, where I speak. Where I do speak, as they say, even while revealing a tacit complicity, perhaps even a dissent between to do and to say, when stating simply, I speak. Doing thus, saying or speaking, may simply emphasize the actual taking place of speech as an act, an action or activity. Speech not only as a performance out of the blue and into the blue, but a performance performing something in view of a certain production or perfection, forma perfecta. I do speak thus means or seems to mean to say that I speak in order to have spoken, that my speech will have given shape to a linguistic form. I say something in view of something having been and having actually been said in the past perfect. When I do speak, I speak in order to do something with words. I consider my dictum a factum. To say that I do speak seems to undo a powerful commonplace, a saying or dictum about the relation between language and action or deed. In Latin, the dictum goes dictum factum, in German gesagt, getan. A saying, proverb, sprichwort, dictum is always built in such a way, not only relating to a fact as evidence, but incorporating the fact it itself. This fact here, in, in the saying dictum factum, emphasizes the subordination of language to action. Words only speak in order to prepare for speechless deeds to be done. As if saying stammeringly, I do not speak, I do, do. The most accurate description of this theory of practice according to which speech is always categorical speech that demands its annihilation for the sake of deeds, appears in the funeral speech recorded or invented by Thucydides in the second book of the Peloponnesian War, which Pericles delivers before the mass graves of the demos situated at the border of the polis and filled with Athenian soldiers killed during the first year of the war. The task of Pericles' Epitaphios Logos, his funeral speech, is to praise the deeds of the dead. The axis around which his talk revolves is the relation between Logos and Ergon. Words have to be spoken not only in remembrance of deeds done, but in order to uphold the dead as glorious models for the undertaking of deeds to come. But because of this declared asymmetry between words and deeds, an asymmetry that stems from the fact that words have to serve the deeds they are going to provoke, while those who receive spoken order to act accordingly have to obey the words. Because of this oscillation between words and deeds, which undermines hierarchy, Pericles has to speak using words against words. He has to speak against the very words he speaks because also words prepare the works and deeds they are calling for. They also postpone and delay, slow down and deviate. They endanger and threaten what they announce for as long as they continue to announce the deed. As long as words are spoken, deeds are not being done. Thus, Pericles has to speak in favor of a political use of words against a poetical use of words. This, at least, is the distinction drawn in his funeral speech. Good words, the politician's words, will provoke effective deeds, kairios ergon. Bad words, the poet's words, logos kompos, are pompous words, spoken for the sake of pleasing the ear, according to Pericles. 
The model for this latter dangerously useless use of words is Homer. I quote, we have no need of a Homer to sing our praises or of any encomiast whose poetic version may have immediate appeal, but then fall foul of the actual truth. End quote. The word poetic here isn't in the Greek text, but inserted as if emanating from the Greek into the latest English translation of the Peloponnesian War by Martin Hammond from 2009. Yet Pericles concedes it remains difficult to turn words into the measure, metron, for the kairos of effective deeds. As if there were no measure and no guarantee for either a useful use of words or a useless use of words. Even their uselessness cannot be guaranteed. In using words, no line of demarcation separates their usefulness from uselessness. Nevertheless, there is a sign, semayon, that marks the effective, deed-provoking use of words in the essence of Pericles. And this sign is the polis itself. The polis, including the graves, semata, of fallen soldiers situated at its borders, is a monument, a mute and monumental sign of political power. Athens is a sign of power, as are her graves. Sema and Semeon, both words that Pericles uses interchangeably in his funeral speech. For Pericles, the polis is the better poem. But the shape or skyline of this polis is that of a city of the dead, necropolis, the poem, a tomb. The turn of phrase, I do speak, not only undermines a current distinction, so current or common indeed, that it may be called an undercurrent of our everyday relation to language and the world, between necessary but mere speech and speechless but real or effective deeds and actions. To say, I do speak, does not simply turn doing into the autopoetic, theologically oriented performance of speech as act or deed in view of finally providing a given semiotic form considered a container for semantic contents. To say that I do speak does not simply emphasize, irritatingly enough, speech as an act or activity or deed, but opens the ear for other, less audible undercurrents, murmuring questions. What am I doing to, what do I do to speech or language when I do speak? What is done through? What does doing do through language that speaks? And what is that we call doing? What am I doing here when saying that I speak? The question touches upon what in ancient Greek is called poiein, and in German, tun, <coughs> to do. According Jakob Grimm's etymological and lexicographical research in the two volumes of Deutsche Mythologie, um, and I'm quoting here from the third edition from 1854, as well as in the entries Antun and Abtun, written for the first volume of Deutsches Wörterbuch, published in 1854, Two main semantic layers divide the verb tun, both intimately linking doing and saying, deed and speech, as well as more graphically or incisively doing and writing. As I set out to discuss poiein, I want to pause here for a moment, emphasizing both of these semantic layers that are cut apart from one another while sharing a strange complicity with the one but not necessarily the same word, tun, poiein. The verb antun, literally to do something to someone, ad ad and facere in Latin, afficere, relates back to tun, to do, as zaubern, to conjure, charm, or fascinate, to spell by way of spelling letters, words, or sounds, and signs. 
In Middle High German already it was in common linguistic use, as Jakob Grimm points out in Deutsches Wörterbuch, to avoid saying what exactly speech could do to someone by preferring the formulaic notion to do it, es tun. Still today you can hear someone say in German, du hast es mir angetan. You have done it to me, you charm me, you attract me, I am under your spell, thus you affect me, never without erotic undertones. But instead of someone causing the charm, it could also be something, a word or sound, a smell, a name or gesture. The verb abtun, instead, literally to do or take away, to remove something from someone, but also more incisively, to cut or rip apart, to slaughter, schlachten, up and farkere, thus afikere again, though this semantic version, this mortal effect never made it into the Latin dictionary, relates back to tun, to do, as opfern, to cut into parts, to sacrifice. The verb tun in both forms, antun, to charm, and uptun, to slaughter, seems to taboo conjuring and mutilating gestures, which are both inseparable from speaking. The word tun, as well as its variations antun and uptun, does, so it seems, say something without saying it. The same counts for the Latin verbs facere, operari, and agere, all designating without saying so the killing of a victim for sacrificial ends, as well as for ancient Greek, where the verb retsein, drawn from erdein, which is ergain, ergon, by commutation and mutilation of letters translated in the dictionaries as to do and to make, designates the same immolating gesture in the context of ritual slaughter or sacrifice. The verb tun, to do, proceeds, so it seems, undercover, explicitly undercover. It provides what is called a double speak, oscillating between protective detection and detective protection, thus undercutting the integrity of both its gestures to cover to uncover. Conjuration, as Jakob Grimm suggests in the chapter Zauber, magic, of his Deutsche Mythologie, has never been ascribed to gods nor human beings, to neither mortals nor immortals, but designates a certain capacity, ability, or power of those living in between the sphere of gods and men, giants, elves, and dwarfs. But their proficiency is less a skill, an art or technique. It is, writes Grimm, mehr angeboren, more or less innate. Conjuration and slaughter, zaubern and schlachten, antun and abtun, the two most distinct aspects of tun, do have, according to Grimm in the same chapter, their common origin in two inseparable pagan practices. Gottesdienst und Dichtkunst, divine service, performing the killing and slaughter of an animal, and the art of poetry. Grimm also calls these two extremes opfern and singen, sacrifice and song. In his dictionary, Grimm translates the Greek code or cover word for ritual slaughter, rezein, as opferbrauch verkünden to announce ritual slaughter. Poet and priest, to speak and to kill, seem to embody two aspects, but both remain inseparable from one another, inseparable of one, but never the same, of what is called doing, tun. Extremes meet. Still in the same chapter, Zaubern, of Deutsche Mythologie, Jakob Grimm, in order to emphasize the co-originality of conjuration as incantation and slaughter, reminds us that both the Latin facere, to do, to make, 
and the Greek, Greek Erdain and Rezain, to make, to do, are not only used as covers for the undercover designation of ritual slaughter, but also for what is called zaubern and bezaubern, to bewitch, to enchant, to charm and captivate, to fascinate. As if slaughter were a mode of incantation between speech and song, as if incantation between song and speech were a mode of slaughtering, of immolation, of what seems to be a given language. I do speak. I touch upon, I cut into a given word. What am I doing here? One more observation from this incursion into the lingu linguistic layers of tune. The one word tune, Fakere Erdain, to do, is not the only one. It provokes or provides others up as well for undercover operations, like Latin agere and operari, like German machen, and probably like this at least is the direction I suggest to take, Greek poiein. The German word gemächt, which I resist translating here, a derivative of machen, to make, provides a particularly fascinating and incisive place of encounter, or not, of at first glance most distinct semantic tendencies. Its least visible semantic layer today, according to Grimm, is the coupling or copulation of sexes, a sexual pairing intimately linked to language as the sphere of contractual preparation for or manifestation of such encounters, Abmachung. Gemächt is a more or less obvious, more or less secret encounter of sexes to less than of sexes, no less than words, fascinating each other in view of a spellbound text. In other words, a contract. Each contract has its charms, each one its harming aspects, each one is bound to conjuration. This contractual tendency in and between letters, words and languages mixes juridical and magical traits, thus gemächt also names the temporary metamorphosis of living beings by way of conjuration or incantation. This transformation in its mechanical aspects prepares gemächt for the designation of all things made, fabricated and produced, including works of art, Kunstarbeit, and particularly linguistic works of art. Old High German gemachon and machon to make means dichten, to make or compose poetry. Gimachida is a dichtwerk or poem. This making or make up of linguistic works of art is, is most often described as proceeding from what is called Zuschnitt, literally cut up, a cut up, or disposition. Dichten initially is bound to cutting and incisive gestures, cutting into words and syllables and letters thus echoing the so-called sacrificial layer of tune, the slaughter. The technical or artificial aspect of gemächt or machen, to make, more generally is always coupled with or visited by a generating aspect. Gemächt as genesis of as well as the quintessence of creation in a religious sense, the world or cosmos. A more visible variation of the most forgotten or repressed aspect of Gemächt, the more or less contractual encounter between sexes, is to be found in the plural Gemächte, designating male and female genitalia as those things or spots apt for procreation, able to engender, or in other words, to make a child. As if child and poem where only two sides, two faces of one, but again not the same, which is to be done or not. What inconspicuously takes place without occupying and determining a clear-cut space, when looking closer at these cover words between Thun, Erdain, Farkere, Machen, and among others, Poyen, is the indistinction or indetermination 
of the strict separation between physis and techne, ars and natura. What about Poyen? When looking into Franz Passo's dictionary of the Greek language, and I quote here from the fifth edition from 1852, you find all the fascinatingly imbricated facets between incantation, fabrication, generation, and immolation, syncopating the semantic areas of tun and machen, to do and to make. The first two translations of Poyen provided by Passo are machen and tun in their technical, workmanlike, or mechanical aspect, to produce or fabricate something designed to last for a while. Poyen means to build and refers to men as well as animals, for instance, bees. In the Iliad, it is said, bees building their house, oikia poiesontai. But the second semantic layer provided by Passo has to do with the generative, procreative aspect of poiein, poiein tekna, to make children. Part of the same semantic facet, but including contractual aspects of language, is poiein in the sense of closing, of choosing and making by taking or giving away a woman as wife, a man as husband. In Passo's dictionary, this genetic facet of Poyen is immediately followed by Poyen as Dichten, making a poem, recurrent since Herodotus, from which to poema, the poem, is drawn, a use recurrent since Plato. Poiesis is the making of things, their fabrication in a most general sense. In a less general, more juridical sense, it indicates the acceptance as adoption of a child opposing the adoptive, or if one could say so, the made-up father, or poietos pater, and the father as progenitor, who made the child, or gono pater, poien as fabrication against poien as generation. But the word ends up designating fabrication in a strict sense of linguistic works of art, poiemata, by a poietes. Poet is the word to replace the former aiodos, a term recurrent in Homer, Hesiod, and Pindar, a singer who does not sing but receives his words from the muse. The distinct quality of the poietic, of what the poietes, or poet, does is neither practicos nor theoreticos, is neither theory nor praxis, but does something with words, not without doing something to words, in such a way that the poem remains as some paralinguistic thing, a word thing, provoking theoretical and practical approaches without coinciding with either of them. Poiesis is also neither a mere technical process or procedure out of an encounter between a poet and the realm of words in view of a poem to be formed, nor mere natural procreation out of the more or less contractual encounter between sexes in view of a child to be born. But poiesis, conceived as poetic craftsmanship, remains entwined or interwoven with a drive or desire as if for procreation. In Plato's Symposium, to which I will turn in a second, it is said by Diotima, telling the story of Eros's conception out of the encounter between penia, poverty, and poros, resource, late at night in a garden in the fringes of a great feast given by the gods in honor of Aphrodite's birth. And I quote from the translation by Lamb uh, from 1925. Quote, now resource, grown tipsy with nectar, went into the garden of Zeus, and there, overcome with heaviness, slept. Then poverty being of herself so resourceless, Aporian, she is the figure of Aporia, devised the scheme of having a child by resource, and lying down by his side, she conceived er Eros." 
end quote. To have a child by resource, in Lamb's rather pale translation of the Greek verb poiesastai, to have is the, the rather pale translation of this, this verb poiesastai. Friedrich Schleiermacher's German translation relates to the same passage more pregnantly as ein Kind mit Poros zu erzeugen. She devised the scheme of begetting poiesastai, a child with poros. How does the oscillation between technical and physical aspects in Poyen affect the making of a poem? If, according to Plato's Kratilos, the two most current considerations of words and naming take words either fuse, that is, as natural correspondences, as if grown out of the things they name, or nomo, tending towards a contractual and conventional, that is, contingent and variable shape of words, what then is the poetic relation to naming and words? What exactly does a poet do to words when making a poem? What does a poem do to the language in which, at first glance, it has been traced or written, of which it seems to be a part, to which it seemingly belongs? What are they doing here, these words, I drew together or felt drawn to in order to build a text or poem? What do they do, these words, to each other? At one point in Plato's dialogue, Comedies, Socrates and Comedies are discussing the difference between pratein, to do, and poiein, to make. Carmides insisting on the difference between both. Poiesis is not a praxis, nor is it hard work or labor, in view of some ergon, a work to be worked out or crafted. Poiein, says Carmides, as I have learned from Hesiod, he adds, according to whom work, ergon, is no disgrace, whereas worklessness or idleness is. Poiein, he says, may be disgraceful as long as the beautiful is not involved. And to describe the making of the thing, poema, or poem to be made, he uses the verb gignestai, which is also used for what comes more or less naturally, for what is born. Comedies considers poiesis a genesis, the making of a poem generation. The call for beauty, Carlos, in order to avoid disgracefulness in the making of what is called a poem, in the passage I just mentioned, recalls Diotima's speech on love, Eros, in Plato's Symposium. At one point in her speech, to better explain whom or what Eros embodies, Diotima turns toward poetry. This turn is nothing less than illustration. It cuts deep into the mechanics, if one can say so, of poiein taken in the strict sense uh, of the word, to do something with words, to do something to words. Eros, the son of Poros, who always finds a way where others don't, and Peña, or aporia, waylessness, but she will find, as you have heard, a way to beget poiein, to make a child with Poros. Eros. Eros, says Diotima, is neither God nor man, neither mortal nor immortal, but a great daimon, daimon megas, moving in between and commuting, hamenoyain, between gods and men, mortals and immortals, which without Eros wouldn't know about each other. Eros daimon, is not only moving in between, but cutting into both ends of the relation he initiates and supports, thus opening them for each other. What Eros carries, explains, interprets, and provides are both extremes of what Poyen is about, incantation and slaughter, to spellbind and to cut apart. This resonates with Diotima's words in Lamb's English translation. I quote, 
Through errors are conceived all divination and priestcraft concerning sacrifice and ritual and incantations, and all soothsaying and sorcery." End quote. Eros, Diotima explains to Socrates, who feels, he says, drawn to Eros because of his beauty, Eros is not beautiful, but love for what is beautiful. Eros is not the beloved, Eromenos, but the lover, Erastes. Love only loves what is beautiful, but only the beloved appears beautiful to the lover. If Eros, the son of Poros and Aporia, who embodies love, is not the beloved but the lover, then what love loves, the beloved of love, is the lover. Love for love. Love loves in what it loves, that which escapes the beloved, a lover. Eros, the lover, loves in the beloved beauty both tendencies, what goes beyond the beloved, an excess, and what remains behind the beloved, a lack. Eros embodies the restless place where excess and lack of love encounter each other in the lover as a poros aporia. Love, it seems, is always only love for love, always already more than it is. Love, in other words, is not, but loves. Diotima makes more explicit this strange coupling or doubling of love with love, love loving love, when she inquires into the nature of the most beloved, namely eudaimonia. Schleiermacher translates the word as Glückseligkeit, supreme happiness, bliss, ecstasy. Eros had initially been called, as you remember, a great daimon, daimon megas, but his highest aim is eudaimonia, the prefix oi indicating the intensification of daimonia. Eros is daimon eudaimon. But what exactly is this daimon longing for when longing for nothing but for daimonia in its most intense manifestation, eudaimonia? Daimon ref refers back to the ancient Greek verb daiomai, describing the gesture of cutting into and cutting apart something. Walter Porzig in his article Daimon from 1923 writes, and I translate, The object of division is prey, more precisely food, that is, meat. Accordingly, the actual meaning of the Greek root dai, or da, as far as it can be perceived in Homer, seems to have been this, devouring by dismembering, dismembering by devouring, related to predator animals and birds of prey over a carcass. End quote. This initial meaning of diomai as ripping up and devour helps to clarify the daimon's character. He is the one disrupting and devouring the corpses. This is still part of the quote. <laughs> it ends here. It is almost impossible at this point not to think of Penthesilea near the end of Christ's play of mourning, who, after having killed and literally bit into the corpse of the beloved Achilles, ripping out parts of flesh, becomes aware of what she just did and says, and I quote, so war es ein Versehen, Küsse, Bisse, das reimt sich, und wer recht von Herzen liebt, kann schon das eine für das andere greifen. I translate, so it was a mistake, kisses, bites, they rhyme, and whoever loves with a true heart can easily take the one for the other. At this point in her speech, when she presents Eros as daimon oi daimon, the one who oscillates between no longer and not yet, a love at once bereft of love, love longing for love, and excessively, excessively beyond the beloved, the Otima turns to names and naming, to poiein and poiesis. Eros, she states, 
though seemingly the name for love in general, only names a particular mode, a single form of love, its highest manifestation. There are names for other minor forms of love. Take for example, and now she turns to poetry, what is commonly called poiesis. And I quote from Lamb's translation, you know that poetry, poiesis, is more than a single thing. For of anything whatever that passes from not being into being, the whole cause is composing or poetry. So that the productions of all arts are kinds of poetry and their craftsmen are all poets. But still they are not called poets. They have other names while a single section disparted from the whole of poetry, merely the business of music and meter, is entitled with the name of the whole. This and no more is called poetry. Those only who possess this branch of the art are poets." End quote. An excessive lack, I have no better word or name at hand, an excessive lack of naming affects both love and poetry. The name Eros is commonly in excessive use, naming all kinds of longing, no less than the name of poiesis, commonly naming all kinds of fabrication or formation from not being into being. But only one particular form of love, only one particular form of poetry deserves bearing the name of eros and poiesis. It is the love that is in lack of love, longing for nothing but love, only love that loves to love, only love that is not, nor simply is not love, does in fact relate to the name. Only love excessively incompatible with love coincides with the name. The rest, not only common use of love and poetry, but of names and naming is mere som somnambulism, sleepwalking speech and love. At first glance, the turn toward poiesis seems to happen out of the need for illustration. The common ubiquitous use of poiesis, just like the excessive use of errors in everyday speech and life, works like a cover. As if to make forget, to extinguish or repress, without the least chance of return, remembrance of the unforgettable. The only use of poetry and of love deserving this name. But the relation between eros and poiesis, as will become clear in what follows, is not sheer similarity or illustration. It is unimaginably, irritatingly intense and intimate. The first hint, taking place almost undercover, as if not happening at all, is the Otima's emphatic repetition that to long for eudaimonia is the most mighty, most beguiling love for all of all." End quote. The turn of phrase, most mighty, most beguiling love for all, seems for all, that it means for every human being, for every animated being. The turn of phrase, most mighty, most beguiling love for all, seems to be cut out of a poem, as the editors tell. Seems to be cut out of a poem by some unknown poet. But the poem doesn't simply name Eros. Instead, it offers a strange and strangely disfiguring reduplication, as if stammering, of the name or word or particle or sound pattern, Eros. The most beguiling love is an expression rendered in ancient Greek as doleros Eros. Eros is the most mighty form of love in that it is the most cunning, most deluding, artful, tricky form of love, doleros. But to call the highest manifestation of eros, doleros, eros, is not just a designation. The poetic turn of phrase doleros, eros, does something to language no less than to love. The excessive doubling of eros here is nothing less than sheer mechanical repetition of one and the same linguistic form. The sequence doleros eros cuts twice into a given form, mutilating the evident self-sameness of both doleros, spelled with omicron, 
and eros, spelled with omega. Dol, eros, eros. Oscillating between small and big, poor and rich, lack and excess. What happens here comes close to the devastation of a linguistic form. Love, when it happens, is a disaster to all known forms of love. It does something to love. Poetry, when it happens, is a disaster to all known forms of poetry. It does something to language. But if the comparison between eros and poiesis in the Ultima speech is not simply due to the need of illustration, if it is not only about superficial similarity, as the twisted turn of phrase doleros eros seems to indicate, how exactly then do poiesis and eros relate to each other? The explanation of this intimate complicity or co-implication takes place in the heart of Diotima's speech. Eros, it has been said, is the highest manifestation of love, leaving behind all other forms of longing. It is paradoxically love in lack of love, love longing for nothing but love. Accordingly, Poiesis names the highest manifestation of making, the making of linguistic artifacts, exceeding all other forms of making, in that it remains in lack of a perfect form. The poetic doing does something to language, but not in order to be done. What then is Poiesis longing for? Diotima's first move as she approaches Eros and Poiesis is to introduce the notion of Genesis, immediately splitting it in two. Eros, she explains, is not of the beautiful. I quote, it is of engendering and begetting upon the beautiful. This longing for generation and birth upon the beautiful proceeds according to either the body or the soul. Body and soul share the desire for generation and birth. Mortals do engender mortals, but this proliferation of mortals upon generation it's, is itself, the Otima goes on to say, something immortal, atanatos, mixing once again lack and excess, for it remains dubious whether continuous excessive procreation of mortals by mortals will overcome mortality or will remain forever exempt from what it tries to reach. But wouldn't remaining forever exempt, as I just said, lead or promise or pretend to lead to something like the immortalization of mortality? What remains with such a notion is neither solution nor relief, but a porous aporia. To engender is an effort of the nature of all mortals to reach immortality. Therefore, love also longs for immortality, or more precisely, Eros is all mortals longing, humans and animals alike, for immortality. The impression of a lasting, even everlasting presence among mortal beings is due to the mechanics of substitution upon generation. And I quote, another new in place of an old, end quote. The impression of enduring presence of one and the same living body, autos, is due to sexual encounters driven by eros, heterogeneous interruptions. A similar operation, according to Diotima, affects the soul. Here, the incapacity to last, the intermittent rhythm of disappearance and appearance, growth and decay, touches upon knowledge, episteme. The arrival of each single knowledge being affected by departure, exodus. The desire to keep incoming knowledge present, at hand and by heart, is threatened by forgetting, lethe. In the case of mortal bodies, what compensates their loss is generation. In the case of knowledge, visiting the soul, what mitigates its departure and forgetting, lethe, is what the Otima ca calls melete, which Lamb translates as conning, 
and Schleiermacher as Nachsinnen. Literally, Melete designates the anxious care for somebody or something. Melete, not unlike the poetic fragment Doleros Eros, echoes Lethe, as if retaining the name for what causes its loss, forgetfulness, as if saying, don't forget to remember that forgetting takes place. Melete, a conning or care for, does something. In order to compensate for a vanishing piece of knowledge, it inserts empoyen, literally to do something into empoyen. It inserts a reminder, memory or recollection, neme, into the soul in such a way that the vanished piece of knowledge still seems to be present, seems to remain, and seems to remain the same, autos. The procreated child, tokos, gone, as if to make forget, or at least as if to delay almost infinitely the vanishing of mortal bodies, including its own, exactly correlates with the imposition of memory, neme, into the soul, as if to make forget the vanishing of knowledge, in other words, the soul's forgetfulness. But in between these two operations, the generation of a child and the implantation of memory, both being related to Poyen, there takes place a third operation, as Diotima suggests, this one linguistic or paralinguistic. This operation is about naming and names. The experience of constant change, constant inconsistency, in the case of a child, or more generally speaking, of a human mortal being, seems to be suspended or delayed because of the name it bears. And I quote, as someone is called the same from childhood until old age. Unquote. The name gives the impression of self-sameness and duration as does a child and memory. But all three are operations in the sense that they are trickery. Diotima at one point uses the word mekane, lamp translates as device, and Schleiermacher Veranstaltung. How does poiesis fit into this constellation of child and memory and name? Diotima's speech takes another turn toward a further modification of eros, now determined as the singular affection among, among mortals, and I quote, of winning a name and laying up immortal fame, Kleos Athanaton, for all time to come." End quote. The desire for an immortal name undoes the desire for a child. For this, Diotima continues, even more than for their children, they are ready to run all risks and sacrifice their lives. End quote. For the spell of a name, they put up even with the possibility of being slaughtered. Diotima again, do you suppose that Alcestis would have died for Admetos or Achilles have sought death on the corpse of Patrocles if they had not expected to win immortal memory, Athanaton Neme? End quote. The two key terms Diotima comes up with in this passage describe the two pillars of Greek epic poetry, both of which can be found in Homer. They consider language the immortal memory, Athanatos Neme, in order to provide unwithering fame, Kleos Aftiton, of a name. The highest manifestation of love according to the body, longing for immortality, is the procreation of a child, bearing a name. But the highest manifestation of love according to the soul is the procreation by poets, poetai, of a poem. Poems, Diotima concludes, are the better children. I quote, everyone would choose to have got children such as these poems. She calls them more beautiful and more immortal, more beautiful and more immortal, rather than the human sort, merely from turning, merely from turning, <laughs> Stop. Sorry. 
It's okay. It's all about interruption here. Um, poems, Diotima concludes, are the better children. See you in a while. <laughs> and again, poems are the better children. <laughs> and I quote again, everyone would choose to have got children such as these, poems, rather than the human sort, merely from turning a glance upon Homer and Hesiod and all the other good poets, poetas, and envying the fine offspring, Eggona, they leave behind to procure them immortal glory and memory. Atanaton kleos kaim nemen. End quote. They all, says Diotima, earlier on in her speech, all mortals do poyain all they can to gain unwithering fame of their name. They will even die for immortality, that is, for immortal memory. Many consider dying for their child, but poems are the better children. This tacitly implies, it is not said, but does take part, that the love, eros, for poems is the highest manifestation of love, as well as that poems, linguistic artifacts, the highest manifestations of poiein in general, embody eros in its most excessive drive, a most excessive lack. Eros, always the lover, never the beloved beauty, is not and is not love. It never coincides with itself, with what is called its name, with the name calling for love, but loves to love, longing for nothing but for longing for almost nothing, going beyond everything one could imagine longing for and thus remaining irretrievably behind what is called and understood as longing for. Eros loves to undo what it seems to be as well as what it seems to love. The poem, accordingly, is not, is not a poem, not a generated, fabricated linguistic form, a given, but does something to linguistic forms that undoes both the words, letters, and syllables apparent self-sameness, coherence, and indivisibility, as well as the impression of their being, being there, as if having something to say. Poems do say as if they were saying this or that, but never reach the point where one could say that what had to be said finally has been said. In other words, done. And that we are done here. We are not. <laughs> but what then are we doing here? And who we? The only poems deserving that name, remember, are not poems and not deserving the name. The only poets deserving that name are not, nor are they poets. Both poets and poems but poet and poem are not their names. Embody, just like children, names and memory, but more intensely so, porous aporias. The strange complicity of children with poems, poems with children, as if undoing the more or less strict, more or less porous distinction between physis and techne, ars and natura, is taken up in a passage of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. This is the second part of three. This passage, which appears... This, but they get shorter and shorter. <laughs> this passage, which appears in Book 9, relates to a passage in Book 8. Both books are dedicated, as you know, to a discussion of philia, translated as friendship, love. The poet's relation to their poems seems to illustrate a particular form of friendship, that between parents and their offspring, and more precisely, that between a mother and her child. 
In Book VI, Aristotle states a, different, a difference, almost a strict distinction between poiesis and praxis. According to Rackham's English translation, a distinction between making and doing. And I quote, making is different from doing. Doing is not a form of making, nor making a form of doing, end quote. But what then does making, poiesis, poiein, mean? There is no art, techne, explains Aristotle, that is not, by way of logos, concerned with making, poietike. Quote, all art deals with bringing something into existence, genesin, the origin of which lies in the maker and not in the thing made. For art does not deal with things that are or become of necessity or according to nature, since these have their origin in themselves. But as doing and making, praxis and poiesis are distinct, it follows that art, being concerned with making, is not concerned with doing. And art and chance, in a certain sense, are dealing with the same, as Agathon says, a poet, uh, uh, Aristotle is quoting here, as Agathon says, and he quotes, art loves chance, as chance loves art. Techne tuchen esterxe kai tuche technen. End quote. A poem's genesis is neither due to nature, physis, nor to necessity, Anarche. All things natural or necessary have their origin in themselves. One may call them autogenic. They develop and vanish according to what seems inevitable, calculable fate. A poem instead, call it heterogenetic, has its origin in the maker or the making. This origin is neither a given pattern, matrix, term, idea or paradigm. It is nothing but chance, touché. Or more precisely, according to a poet's line, love of chance, which in its turn or in return is not a given or possession, nor a tool, but love of techne. Techne and touché do love each other. What results from their encounter with language is the making of what remains unforeseen and unforeseeable out of love for the divisibility, precarity, and porosity of generated forms, poems. Indeed, poems result unnecessarily, incalculably, unnaturally, and excessively so from interventions into, from the love of interventions into given linguistic forms. No poem comes into its own. Their making doesn't simply follow rules or devices. It isn't application. It happens at the brink of artlessness. Therefore, each poem differs, as poets do from poets, from what is called a poem, different from what seems to be, and to be itself a poem. The poem does not exist. It exists existence, exists excessively. The poem itself is not itself, but selfless, as if incorporating the most accomplished form of friendship, according to Aristotle, the selfless friend. This selflessness, not only of the poem, but poet too, brings up again the question of the name of appropriate or proper name. Aristotle touches upon it at one point in Book 8. Friendship, one reads at the outset of Book 8, is an object of dispute. Some say that those similar to each other are attracted by each other. Some say that similarity provokes repulsion and distaste, as, for example, in the case of potters, keramais, and pottery. No potter wants to be lumped together with any other. No potter wants to be called a potter, sharing one and the same name that would annihilate differences for the sake of similarity, uniformity, and corporate identity. Each one is almost simultaneously attracted and repelled by two options, 
to say either I am the only potter or what I do has nothing to do with what all the other potters do. My pottery is not pottery at all. I am not a potter. This also goes for poets and poetry. And in fact, the text from which Aristotle draws the example of the potter, a passage in Hesiod's Works and Days, also names the poet avant la lettre, Aioidos, the Homeric singer, and I quote, and potter is angry with potter, and craftsman with craftsman, and beggar is jealous of beggar, and minstrel of minstrel, end quote. Referring back to the description in Book 6 of Poiesis as generation of those things which don't have their origin in themselves, but in the artist's technites, love for chance, Aristotle at one point in Book 9 distinguishes poets among all other artists' technitae because of their excessive, overwhelming love for their own work, the poems. I quote, every artist, says Aristotle, loves his own work more, Malon, than that work, if it were come to life, would love him. <laughs> <laughs> but most of all, but most of all, Malista, this is true among poets, poetas, who love their poems, poemata, beyond all measure, hyper agoposi, as parents love their children. End quote. The love of the generated work, if it were to come to life for its procreator, would never reach the love of the procreator for his or her work. All artists love their work more, more than their work could ever love them. But the maximalization of this more of love, beyond any measure, takes place in a poet's relation to his or her poem, comparable only to the love of parents for their children. A poet's relation to the poem, as if to his or her child, is hyperbolic. Love beyond love. But how do parents love their children? Techno. Aristotle takes up this question in Book 8 as part of his discussion of philia, friendship. All friendship, says Aristotle, involves community, koinonia. And I quote, but the friendship between relatives is different from friendship between members of a comradeship, end quote. Each form of friendship, each one forming a community, koinonia, seems to be generated by its distinction from another form of friendship. What all these communities share is separation, inseparability, Though different from all other forms of friendship, the friendship between relatives seems to differ from itself, seems to appear under various forms. Nevertheless, this internal difference, differentiation and diversity seems to have its model in parents' love for their child. But this couple's love, involving at least two faces, sexes, figures, names, seems to be modeled according to a paternal, paternal face or sex or shape. Paternal affection seems to dominate, it seems, to be the name for parental affection toward a child. Like I quote, parents love their children as part of themselves, whereas children do love their parents as the source of their being. End quote. No child has its origin in itself. A child's generation, therefore, is its poiesis, does not happen according to necessity nor nature, but exclusively because of love of chance. Children, like poems, don't have their origin in themselves, but in their parents. But their parents, children themselves, don't have their origins in themselves either. Where then, this is as Freud knew, a children's question. Where do children come from? Where do poems come from? Their origin takes place, so it seems, in an incisive encounter between sexes, in a most incisive encounter within, no less than in between letters, syllables, and words, in a moment of excessive, hyperbolic love of chance, or chance of love. 
parents seem to be, without being their origin, at the origin of their children, exposed to what takes place. And the paternal shape or shade seems to provide, at least at first glance, a simulacrum of origin. Another remark, further down in the same section, introduces a symmetry into the parents' relation to each other as well as to their child. Parents love their children as a part of themselves, but they themselves do not form a whole, neither in part nor together. Separate from each other, they entertain separate relations to their child, which seems to be the bond, Sündesmos, giving birth to the parents as parents, as one pair, so to speak, at the moment of birth. But Aristotle's other remark shatters this impression. Parents do love their children earlier from birth on, and thus longer than a child its parents. But the parents' love for their offspring is not one. Mothers, meteres, I quote, do love, the, the verb here is feline, mothers do love more, malon, end quote. Not only more than a child could love its parents, but also more than a father loves his child. The sentence immediately following this remark introduces, in parentheses, as if preparing for an explanation of this more of love in mothers, the notion of separation. I quote, parents then love their children, tekna, as themselves, one's offspring being, as it were, another self, other because of separation, end quote. The mother's love for her child introduces a cut into unity and immediacy of what has been described further up as the parent's love for their child. Only the child's birth, the separation, gives birth, it has been said, to the parents as parents. Not only do they separate from each other in the moment of the child's separation from its mother, but they immediately separate from each other in their relation to that child. Mothers do love their children more. They do bear or carry, as he said, a child to term, which is not a given or datum, but the experience of birth a separation. The unfolding of a mother's more of love develops around this cut. It could have its origin in a mother's love to overcome a child's loss in the moment of birth, to outdo separation. It also could be love for separation in at least two different ways. Love for separation as for the necessary condition of possibility for reappropriation of the child, or love for separation unconditionally. Parents do love their children as themselves, it is said, immediately before the sentence introduces separation. If separation is at the origin of the experience of myself as another self, in other words, of each self as other, different not only from each other self, but from itself, then separation is another word for chance or love, the love of chance, which is neither natural nor necessary. Separation, the more of love for separation, at this point is another word for the experience of poiesis in general, for the experience of poetry, or more precisely for poetry as experience in particular. For according to what is developed in this passage of Book 8, focusing on the symmetries in the parents' love for their offspring, condensed into a mother's more of love, in Book 9, it is not only said that every artist, technites, loves his own work more, malon, than that work, if it were to come to life, would love him, but also that poets do love this more of love the most, malista. Quote, for they love their own poems, poemata, beyond all measure, as they would love their children." End quote. Does a poet's love for his or her poem look more like a father's or a mother's love for their child? It seems that a mother's more of love, growing out of the experience of separation, serves as a measure here for the end of this passage marks her reappearance. A remark on similarities between Poyen and Philane prepares for her return. I quote, 
to love, philesis, seems to resemble a making or doing, poiesis, being loved and enduring a passive one. Moreover, everybody loves a thing more, malon, if it has caused labor. This is why mothers love their children more than fathers, because to bear a child takes more labor. A mother's more of love for her child than a father's is due to more pain in the making of bringing forth and separating from a child. But in a poet's making and separating from a poem, this more of love due to more pain goes beyond measure. It exceeds the excess of maternal love. Why? Why this excess of immeasurable, inimaginable love and pain Love as if pain, love for pain in the poiein of a poem. Aristotle does not waste a word on it, passes in silence, leaving the question unraised, untouched. It is left behind almost abandoned like a poem or child. The excess of pleasure or love, inseparable from excessive pain, in the making of a poem, goes beyond a mother's love for her child due to the experience of loss or separation. The painful pleasure in the case of a poem's poiesis doesn't simply separate the poet from a linguistic artifact, which then would be considered part of the language in which it was composed. What happens in the making of a poem is more, for every poiesis cuts into the language. These incisions are the poet's pain and pleasure. It separates both poet and poem from the language, logos, to which they seemingly belong. The making of a poem does something to language. It undoes the poet's, undoes the poem's natural or necessary bonds with language. Poems loosen the hold onto language, considered not only a given possession, but the quintessence of man. What is at stake with each poem and you is Aristotle's definition of man as zoon logon echon. The hyperbolic pain and pleasure taking place in the making of a poem are bound to the experience of losing language considered as a hold, a property, and scheme, schema. But this experience secures no hold. The experience of losing language affects the poet's energetic relation to life as feeling alive, so on. The excess of love and pain involved in the making of a poem touch upon anaesthesis, feellessness, to feel, not to feel. The poem abounds with chance. It is not bound to language, nor to itself. Poems don't belong. Poets abound with love for chance. They undo their bonds with language, undoing language, the language of man, language in general. They don't belong neither to mankind nor to themselves. Poets are not poets. And a poem never coincides with what is called a poem. This is the last and third part. You can start throwing things at me. I, I, no, no, <laughs> you're going to endure this. It takes another 20 minutes. Recent texts are rife with distaste, almost hatred, among those called poets for what is called a poem and poetry. In 1947, Georges Bataille published a book under the ambivalent title La Haine de la Poésie which could be read as either the hatred for poetry or the hatred of poetry. The book is composed of three sections, Loresti, Oresteia, Histoire de Rats, Story of Rats, and Dianus. No preface or introduction is provided, but between the excerpt, two quotations from Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Avila, and its first part, the book offers on a separate page just these words. Invocation à la chance. 
invocation of chance. This other insertion or insection into the book's shape echoes the excessive love for chance, Tuché, detached from nature and necessity alike, a sole criterion of poiesis, as distinct from praxis in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And indeed, at one point in the book's first section, it is said, I quote, Un poète ne justifie pas. Il n'accepte pas tout à fait la nature. La vraie poésie est en dehors des lois. A poet does not justify, does not accept nature at all. True poetry is outside of laws. End quote. True poetry refuses the necessity of nature, nature as necessity, the law of nature. The first part of this book, Loresti, itself divided into seven sections, is composed in its first six sections out of poems and poetic prose. Whereas the seventh part, Etre au reste, assembles a series of aphorisms on poetry. Between the book's first and second part, a further page separate from both parts refers back to the composition of the first part. And I quote, I quote just the, the, the English translation. About the publication in one and the same book of poetry and the contestation of poetry, I remain almost unable to explain myself." End quote. This note provides a precision of the book's title. A contestation of poetry invites to read La haine de la poésie as hatred for poetry, a violent renunciation or refusal of poetry. But this book has been republished, slightly modified here and there, and recomposed under the title L'impossible, the impossible, in 1962, the year of Bataille's death. This time, not only the arrangement of the book's three parts has changed, the former first part, L'Oresti, with its aphoristic contestation of poetry at the end, Etre au reste, now marking the end of the whole book, but Bataille also adds a preface, in which he refers back to the book from 1947, commenting on both books' titles. And again, I, I, I quote the, an English translation. Fifteen years ago, I published this book for the first time. Back then, I gave it an obscure title, La haine de la poésie. It seemed to me that only hatred was able to access true poetry. Only in the violence of revolt was the power of poetry. But poetry attains this violence only by evoking the impossible. Almost no one understood the sense of the first title. That's why I finally prefer speaking of the impossible. It is true this second title is far from being more clear. But one day it could." End quote. The preface thus offers a third reading of the book's first title, not just hatred for nor of poetry, these two readings tend to block access to the title's undercurrent, but only hatred for what is not true poetry, only hatred for what is and for what is called poetry, breaks away where there was none, no trace or track before, in other words, nothing but aporia shows the way to poetry. As if Bataille were saying here, only the experience of aporia, waylessness, only her sexual encounter with poros, the making and birth of eros, poros aporias, opens, not without violence, access by excess of rupture to poetry. In one of his notes preparing the making of the preface, for the impossible, but I write, the first title only emphasized the hatred for so-called poetry bound to the taste of the possible. But this hadn't been clearly said. The impossible still is, is above all, mere violence. It is what exceeds the conventions of literary poetry." End quote. The hatred for what is called and known as poetry does violence to linguistic and literary conventions, including violence to the convention of doing violence to such conventions. It does violence to violence in all its possible forms. 
and in so doing, but one may call this the impossible, undoes the impression of language and poetry as a given, whether this given is understood as a gift by nature or convention. But Bataille holds on to the name of poetry. There seems to be something encapsulated in the name, in what is called poetry, that exceeds excessively what is called poetry. A violence to violence from within that rips poetry, poetic forms apart, thus opening poetry to the impossible, for what Bataille calls la poésie véritable, true poetry, true to the hatred that does away with what is called poetry. This violence to violence, inseparable from poiesis, refers back to the two extremes, to most extreme manifestations of poien, as distinguished and related to each other by Jakob Grimm, and the two opposite modifications of the German verb tun, to do. Antun, magic spell and incantation, zaubern, and abtun, sacrifice or slaughter, schlachten. In his preface to the impossible, Bataille indicates these extremes as la mort, death, and le désir, longing for. And I quote, death and desire only have the powers that oppresses, takes your breath away. Solely overdoing or excess of death and desire allows to attain the truth, end quote. Only Poyen, in its most extreme manifestations, where extremes meet, only the excessive desire for slaughter will undo poetry. That is the outcome of poiesis in its most conventional understanding as the making or fabrication of something in order to be made and to attain poetry. The violence or violent desire, desire to outdo, undo poetry, the violence of linguistic fabrication, and reach poetry, violence done to this violence from within in order to undo linguistic violence, language considered a weapon of mass destruction, is at the core of the aphorisms included in La Haine de la Poésie under the title Être Orest, Being Orest, Oresti. At one point among these aphorisms it is said, but I only offer scattered fragments, almost excessively explicitly, I quote, poetry opens the night to an excess of desire. The night that is left by poetry's ravages marks inside myself the measure for refusal, refusal of, mad, of my mad desire to exceed the world. Poetry also exceeded this world, but remained unable to change me. It replaces the slavery of natural chains with free associations, destroying those chains, but verbally." End quote. Poetry exceeds the world, replacing the terror of what seems necessity of natural ties and restrictions by free association. Another version of what Aristotle calls the love of chance. But poetry's deliberate excesses seem to remain themselves restricted. They destroy the world of words, a world bound by syntactic chains. This last sentence seems to be colored by regret for poetry's limited power of destruction. But Bataille will excise this sentence from the second version of the book, The Impossible. The text continues further down. Poetry was a simple detour. She helped me to escape the world of discourse which had become for me the natural world, with her I entered some kind of tomb, where, inside the death of the world of logics, the infinity of possibles took birth. Logics at the moment of death gave birth to mad riches." End quote. Poetry in this passage passed down toward some silent space, into some kind of tomb, turns out to have a sex. With her, avec elle, with her I went down there. Due to her I escaped from the world of logics, logos, 
where the sway of discourse had imposed itself on all and everything as if being the nature of the world. But this escape from the world of logics, language as logos, logos as logics, melting nature and necessity into an amalgam of unavoidability, fatal attraction, this escape away from discourse along with her, with poetry, escapes into the world of logics as if into some kind of tomb where dying logics give birth to mad riches, another variation of hyperbolic love for chance. It is as if Bataille had written this emblematic um, passage of descent accompanied by Malamé's La Destruction Fuma Beatrice. For poetry here takes the shape of devastation. The night she leaves behind, night of some kind of tomb, is a night of ravages, language dismembered. The night of disjecta membra is an opening, here compared to, to birth, à l'excès du désir. This excess of desire remains inseparable from what has been called slaughter, from what Bataille in the section Etre au reste calls ravage. Some among the most precise descriptions of this opening are given in the section Digression sur la poésie et Marcel Proust in Bataille's l'expérience intérieure, the inner experience. At one point there it is said, I quote, Orestes or Phaedra destroyed are to poetry what the victim is to sacrifice, end quote. Orest here is Orest near the end of Racine's tra tragedy Andromaque, abandoned, devastated, mad. Scattered remainders of what one seemed to be, to bear, a name, Orest. Orest remains as some remainders of Oresti. As one could say in French, Orest, les restes d'Orest. The title Être Orest in La Haine de la Poésie lends itself for such incisions into a given proper name. What Racine does to Orest in Andromaque is, this at least is how Bataille seems to see it, an emblem of what poetry does to words. For further up in the, in the digression, it is said, I quote, of poetry I would say now that she is, I think, the sacrifice where words are victims. The sacrifice of words that is poetry, end quote. And in Méthode de Méditation, Method of Meditation, written around the same, the same time, Bataille is still more precise about this sacrifice. La poésie est une hécatombe des mots sans Dieu ni raison d'être. Poetry is a hecatomb of words without gods nor reason. End quote. The sacrifice in poetry is not a ritual, it is not zaka, but slaughter. The word hecatombe here allows to get a better shape of what in être au reste is called some kind of tomb, in sorte de tombe. Hecatombe, in ancient Greek, hecatombe, is a composite of hecaton, hundred, and booz, ox or cow, or cattle. The ritual killing, slaughter, and burning of cattle for the gods. The comparison of words with cattle goes back at least to ancient Greek poetry. But in poetry, the reason for slaughtering words, according to Bataille, goes missing, is fading away, fails. In common terms, it could be called a sacrilege, an act of heresy, a crime. What at first glance could be called poetry's crime against language and words is not a crime to which jurisdiction would apply, for it is a crime against juridical language the language of sentences, sentencing language, Urteilssprache. Poetry in what it does to words and language goes beyond all known or recognized forms of crime, an excess of crime, and therefore remaining behind everything that ever has been called and will be called a crime. But I calls poetry a simple holocaust or hecatomb. It could be called a children's crime, a crime most innocent. 
Dichtung ist to be read in one of Hölderlin's letters, dies unschuldigste aller Geschäfte. Poetry, dies most innocent of all businesses. But poetry is not what it is called or taken for, not poetry. Near the end of digression, Bataille states, what remains unseized, that literature is nothing if it isn't poetry, poetry being the opposite of its name, literary language, expression of hidden desires of shady life, is perversion of language, and even more so than eroticism is perversion of sexual functions." End quote. I approach the end. The last sentence of Bataille's preface to L'Impossible asserts that the impossible imposes itself. And I quote, we are able to and even have to respond to something which, not being God, is more powerful than any law. That impossible. One among, uh, end quote, one among the notes written for this preface reads, the impossible is literature. That impossible access to which is broken, that impossible access to which is broken by poetry, which is not poetry, nor what is called poetry, is another name for poetry. It imposes poetry's exposure. Seven years after the publication of L'Impossible, Paul Celan notes, and I quote, La poésie ne s'impose plus, plus elle s'expose. Poetry no longer imposes itself, it exposes itself. The aphorism doesn't say that poetry imposes its exposure, it shifts away from imposition, from poetry, from poetry as imposition, or demand for poetry. But some imposition, though unsaid, seems to remain, as if encapsulated in the adverb ne plus, no longer, as if saying, without saying so, poetry exposes the imposition to expose itself. The imposition to expose, exposure of that very imposition, does not go without suspicion, almost hatred, for certain aspects at work in Poyen. In a letter to Hans Bender from May 18, 1960, refusing a request to contribute to an anthology of poems, Paul Celan writes, Man komme uns hier nicht mit Poyen und dergleichen. Das bedeutete mitsamt seinen Nähen und Fernen wohl etwas anderes als in seinem heutigen Kontext. I translate, don't bother us with Poyen and the like, that may have meant with all its nearnesses and distances, something other than it in its actual context." End quote. And among the notes for the Meridian, Celan's Büchner Prize speech in 1960, one reads, Gedichte sind nicht herstellbar, poems are not to be produced or fabricated. And Poesie der Poesie, zu deren Verständnis keinerlei etymologische Gemeinplätze von Mache etc. verhelfen, die Machart erklärt das Gedicht nicht. The poetry of poetry, the understanding of which is not provided by any etymological commonplace of make, etc. The make does not explain the poem. Poems are not made in order to be made. What they do to language undoes their making and make up as linguistic artifacts. Among the most violent attacks against the word poetry are certain remarks in the writings of Francis Ponge. In January 1948, a note for my creative method, in which Ponge refers back to the distinction between poiesis and praxis, reads, I quote, Deux choses portent la vérité, l'action, la science, la méthode, et la poésie, merde pour ce mot. Two things bear or carry truth, action, science, method, and poetry. What a shitty word. Back in 1941, in what Ponge calls Appendice au Carnet du Bois de Pin, appendix to my notebook of the Pine Forest, he writes, and I give the English translation, what is at stake in the haunt of this forest 
is less the birth of a poem than a far from being successful attempted killing of a poem by its object. End quote. The language of description and expression, of saying something about something in order to express, give birth to its meaning, to replace the thing itself by what is said about it, its truth in a poem. This desire of expression finds itself cornered here. This at least is the attempt, a most violent desire of the notebook, in order to be killed by the very pine wood that language tries to catch in and as a poem. My desire here is not to express the meaning of a pine wood, but to slaughter a poetic language that pretends to enclose its truth into a poem. And further down in the same appendix, excerpts from two letters to Gabriel Audizio, written in 1941. Je ne me veux pas poète. J'ai besoin du magma poétique, mais c'est pour m'en débarrasser. I don't want or consider myself a poet. I need the poetic magma, but in order to get rid of it. End quote. Years later, in an unpublished dossier dedicated to the sun, Soleil, the most exquisite and extreme of objects being the very condition of birth and decay of all things on earth, Ponge writes, Le soleil n'est pas à former, mais à éventrer. Poésie éventrée, formulation éventrée. The sun is not to be formed, but to be disemboweled. Disemboweled poetry, disemboweled formulation. L'eros qui fait écrire, eros that makes me write, Ponge says somewhere. The excessive and because of its excess most innocent desire to slaughter dismember, disembowel, the making of a language, poetic language, that was up, up in words, as if in arms, to embrace and kill the word, the world. The almost constant rejection of the name poet in Pons' writings rehearses a gesture that Pons once found in one of Horace's satires. In November 1970, he inserts the Latin text of the de de decisive passage into his latest dossier, dossier La Table, which is the table, along with the French translation. And I give you the French translation and then an English one. Écoute ma réponse, elle sera courte. D'abord, je ne me mets pas au nombre de ceux que j'appelle poètes. Listen to my answer. It will be short. First of all, I don't count myself among the number of those I call poets. End quote. As if asking, what am I doing here? And saying, listen, I don't count. I don't count myself among the number of those called poets. I take myself out of their number. I do love for the love of chance to listen, to slaughter, the number, a given, the name. But don't count on what I do. Don't count on me. I, myself, don't count. Thank you. <laughs>